David Penzer, and you're listening to the interactive interview. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the interactive interview on the interactiveinterview.com. I'm James Walsh, joined as always by Daniel Edler with our special guest, David Penzer. David, how you doing? I'm good. How you doing? Doing pretty good. Do you mind if we just get started? Let's do it. Excellent. Uh, first things first, were you a wrestling fan growing up? Uh, yeah, I was actually. Uh, uh, when I was about, I'd say, 12 or 13, I started watching championship wrestling from Florida. And uh, I just uh, I got hooked. I was, uh, I was a fan, but I wasn't one of those fans who would go to the matches. and ch- Even as a kid, I wasn't one of those fans who go to the matches and cheer and boo. Uh, you know, uh, I, I was more of a, I was, I was uh, amazed by the, the business and just, I would, be, I would watch the expressions of the fans, uh, uh, you know, more than, you know, I, I was just amazed at the art form and really, uh, uh, really interested in it. So for me to be involved in the business was, was, was something very cool. Hmm. Uh, did you attend any colleges? I went to University of Florida for, uh, for about two years, majored in partying. I was the uh, social director for my fraternity. <laughs> uh, didn't flunk out, but I just woke up one day. You know, it's it's, it's kind of strange that uh, uh, when you, you go through high school and middle school and, 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 and you know, they, they put so much emphasis on attendance and, and having to be in class and perfect attendance and, and calling your parents if you don't, if you, if you miss school. And, you know, I never played hooky or anything. You know, I wasn't wasn't, you know, I just went to school and, and did my deal, and then all of a sudden you go to college, and the first thing they say is, uh, you know, you, you're already paid. You don't have to come if you don't want to, so. Uh, <laughs> what college was this? University of Florida. I might have to go there because I'm having trouble. <laughs> yeah, they said you don't have to come if you don't want to, so, uh, you know, usually we just get, like, the crib notes from somebody in our fraternity who was responsible and, uh, and, and you know, study it all at the last minute, and I actually did okay. I had like a C plus average, believe it or not. It's actually, if I would have tried, I might be able to, might have, might have done pretty good. But uh, I just woke up one day and said, I'm wasting everybody's time and money, so I'm going to go home and get my life together. And had a, had a lot of fun, and it was a blast. And I'll go back to school sometime. And uh, just not, never went, really went back. So uh, mm. that's actually one of the things I regret. Mm. How did you end up working for WCW? Um, well, uh, it's a kind of an interesting story how I got involved in the business. I sort of had gotten out of professional wrestling and, um, you know, from watching wrestling and, and didn't really follow it that much. Uh, Florida wrestling was kind of not doing that well. And I was involved in college and stuff, and I came back. I didn't have anything to do. And there was a group called um, Global Wrestling Alliance based out of uh, South Florida. It's not the Global Wrestling based out of Dallas that Joe Pesino ran. It's, uh, uh, it was actually the first company to go uh, on the stock market. Uh, and they raised uh, some money uh, selling penny stocks. And, wow, this was about probably about 17 years ago. And uh, it was run by a guy named Dr. Red Roberts was his wrestling name. He was a local uh, uh, South Florida wrestler. Uh, you might remember Rusty Brooks from, he was a, a, a job guy in WWE. Yeah, I remember. I have a match of his against Hulk Hogan. Yeah, Rust, Rusty was, was uh, Red's, Red's tag team partner. Rusty was, you know, the job guy in the WWF, but the big local, you know, indie star in, uh, in South Florida. And um, so anyway, but... Uh, the, his, his, his gimmick was that he was a wrestling psychologist and he would try to, you know, beat his wrestlers, you know, using psychology. And, and I think he, he once even had somebody what, that he was fighting with Baker acted, which is when they, you know, you tell, them, uh, you tell uh, the police that somebody needs to be uh, sent to a, a mental facility for three days, 72 hours, to because uh, you're afraid that they're going to do something. I think that was how he got out of the match. But anyway... Um, he actually was a real psychologist and, and has a, a very good, a very successful practice now that he's gotten out of the business uh, all these years later. But my dad is a psychologist, and um, so they knew each other and were colleagues. And um, when this uh, global wrestling went um, went you know uh, on the stock market, uh, they needed a ring announcer, and uh, I had owned a mobile DJ company from the age of 16 and uh, uh, did it through college and um, did weddings and bar mitzvahs and sweet 16s and, you know, just did real well for myself and also was on the uh, high school radio station and college radio station my senior year of high school. So um, uh, I had a background, I love, I love wrestling, and I had a background in uh, broadcasting and, and, and emceeing, so uh, hmm. uh, they just hooked me up to, to be a part of that, and I ended up, you know, really, like I always 
did, even though, you know, there wasn't a lot of money in it at the time. I, I just uh, I kind of lived at the office almost. And uh, uh, Boris Malenko, Larry Simon, who's uh, Dean Malenko's dad, um, who, uh, who passed away, uh, I just told him, I said, I want to learn the business side. And he said, all right. And he, he taught me a lot about the business side of wrestling. And uh, I started promoting fundraisers for him. And uh, actually, me and Alex Marvez of... Uh, of um, you know, Wrestling Observer fame or whatever, uh, started about the same time. He would help me promote. We would uh, walk around Miami and ha hand out flyers for our fundra for my fundraiser shows. But um, I had about, like, the only three <laughs> uh, successful money-making shows in global wrestling history. And, uh, you know, I just uh, uh, met a guy named Bob Roop. I don't know if you're familiar with Bob Roop. Yes, sir. Yeah. And um, he was the booker for Global. And we got to be real good friends, and after Global ended, we bought the ring and started promoting some indie shows and did some shows in Key West and some uh, flea market shows and stuff like that that were prepaid. And, uh, you know, uh, he went to, he was, uh, back in the Georgia wrestling days, he was the, uh, the kind of the henchman for Ole Anderson, who was the booker. He was his assistant. He would go on the road and get the finishes, and, uh, you know, if anybody's late, uh, he would, you know, tell Ole what went on. Well, when Ole got the book in WCW, um, uh, he called Bob up to be an agent. And Bob had always said, hey, if anything ever happens, I'll, I'll get you up there. And I was like, yeah, you know, right. But he <laughs> did. He, uh, he hooked me up with Jody Hamilton, and um, uh, the rest is history. There's a little bit uh, of insanity in, in that I used to uh, – uh, my, my first job was I didn't even get paid by the office. They would rent me a van, and I would book the enhancement guys, the, the job guys. Um, and Jody – arranged a deal where the job guys would uh, give me $25 of their pay to, to book them and to pick them up and drive them there. And so I would start out in Fort Lauderdale, and anybody who knows Florida knows will know the craziness of this, but I would start out in Fort Lauderdale, go across Alligator Alley, up I-75, picking up guys along the way, and then when I hit Tampa, I'd go back across I-4 to Orlando, picking up guys, and then up the Turnpike to, 70, to 75, and then up to Atlanta, and then we'd go do a show, five guys, turn around and come back. Mm -hmm. And um, for that, I got 125 bucks if I book five guys. And uh, uh, basically, I just, uh, you know, a lot of incentive, a lot of drive, and a little bit of insanity. I think, uh, you know, I ended up, people ended up seeing that I had something to offer. And Jim Ross had come up to me at one point and asked if I'd run talent for the interviews. At first, I just hung around, brought the guys up and hung around. And then I started uh, being in charge of the, all the enhancement guys, getting them to fill out the paperwork. And I just kept doing more and more. And one day, they needed a ring announcer. And... They came up to me. It's actually a funny story. Tony Schiavone came up to me and said, uh, I heard that, um, that you drive guys up from Florida. And I said, yeah. He goes, uh, well, we're looking for a new ring announcer. And I started to lie. You know, the saliva was, you know, I was by, by chomping at the bit. And, uh, wait, you know, figuring he was going to say, well, since you're up here anyway, uh, you know, we'd like to, to, to use you. He said, anyway, to make a long story short, he said, uh, well, he said, there's a guy from Tampa we'd like to give a tryout to. And uh, his name is Dino. He used to work at WWF. And he goes, we'd like to know if you'd pick him up and bring him. Uh, and I said, okay. And, and he started to walk away. And I said, that's now or never, kid. So uh, I said, Tony, uh, Mr. Shivani, I guess back then. Uh, I said, uh, you know, I don't know if you know this. I had talked to Jim Ross, but JR had already gone to WWF, WWF at the time. So yeah. Around. I said, I talked to Jim Ross about this a couple months ago. I said, I don't know if you know this, but... Um, I also ring and have ring announced before. And he said, oh, I didn't know that. I, he said, I'll tell you what. You bring this guy up. He said, we'll give him a tryout. He said, we'll give you a tryout the next TV taping, and whoever we think did the better job will get the gig. I mm. said, fair enough. And I think I won by default because we both were horrible. <laughs> um, but since I, I was pretty familiar with the, with the way the TV was run and how to count down the crowd and how they wanted me to announce things because, you know, I had been there. And, and Did you ever have any – sorry to cut you off. Did you ever have any uh... – contact with Gary Michael Capetta? Oh, yeah. He, he well, was almost like a mentor to me. Uh, I worked under him. It was uh, when Tony Gillum, I don't know if you remember Tony Gillum, mm -hmm. uh, they had, he was the, the second-string ring announcer behind Gary Capetta, and they had promoted him to try to be a play-by-play -play guy, and then he ended up totally screwing up and getting fired. But they were looking for somebody to be uh, Gary's backup, so I ended up as Gary's backup. And as things... Uh, so anyway, so I pretty much won by default, and... Uh, uh, and uh, since I think since I was going to be at the shows anyway, they just figured it was cheaper than to bring two guys up. So, uh, but I got a lot more comfortable as time went on, and, and Gary was great. And, um, uh, you know, he, he came to me probably around 95, 96 and said, I'm not 
I don't think they're going to resign me. And I said, yeah, they will, you know. And he said, no, I think you're going to get the job. And I said, they ain't going to give it to me, you know. And he said, yeah, I think so. We, we, we just spent a lot of time in those six months talking, and he, you know, would tell me about, you know, you know, his little tips and stuff. And I never really copied his style, but, you know, I didn't want to copy, you know, somebody who had been around so long because it would be a blatant ripoff. But I kind of developed my own style. But Gary was great, and, of course, he left, and, and they did hire me full-time. And that was the start of my full-time in WCW. And uh, it was, it was a, a, about one of the other than, you know, watching my children grow up and a couple other things. It was probably one of the top five experiences of my life. What was going through your mind when Eric Bischoff uh, pitched the idea of Monday Nitro? Well, you know, Eric is actually the one who gave me the uh, who gave me the uh, the ring announcing job. It was his final decision, and you know, lot, you could say a lot of things about Eric Bischoff. He, he wasn't he, he wasn't, and probably to this day still is not a people person. Uh, you know, there's some people you'll see and they'll come up and they'll, hey, how you doing? What's going on? You know, you look great. Or you know, after the show, hey, you know, you really did a good job. Pat you on the back. Thank you very much. Eric was none of the above. He, he you know, kind of would walk by, uh, even even when he was an announcer, before he even, uh, you know, this is this wasn't ego that got that, that came with, you know, being running the company. This was, uh, even when he was the third string announcer, he was sort of like that. And But, you know, Eric was always good to me. You know, he, he didn't talk to me a lot. He didn't, you know, pat me on the back a lot. But when it came time for, to, to give me, for, for me to get, you know, get a review or a raise or, or, uh, or anything like that, Eric, he always took care of me. So, you know, um, People could say what they want about Eric Bischoff, and you know he wasn't the easiest person to work for, uh, certainly. But um, he, you know when push came to shove, came to shove, uh, I basically owe a lot, a uh, lot of what happened in my career to him. When he came up with the idea for Nitro, I think everybody thought he was absolutely nuts. Um, but uh, I think after that first week, when Luger walked out and and mm. just everything clicked, and we had Liger and Pillman, and uh, I, I just think that uh, that. Everybody thought that this was gonna this was gonna go somewhere. This was gonna happen, and as it evolved with Hogan and the NWO and and Scott Hall and Kevin Nash walking through the stands and some of the great stuff with Ric Flair and the Horsemen, just so many memories. Uh, I think, and and I challenge anybody that worked for WCW to to correct me, but I believe that um, if you take everybody in the history of WCW from the uh, when Monday Nitro debuted in. Uh, uh, in Minneapolis, the Mall of the Americas, to the very last show when Shane McMahon came out in um, in uh, Panama City. If you talk about production people, if you include production people, talent, uh, office people, security, everybody and their brother, I believe, and anybody could challenge me on this, and I'd be happy to admit I was wrong, that I am the only uh, WCW staff member to never miss a Monday Night Show from the very first one to the last one. I was at every single one. Wow. So, I mean, you know, didn't uh, didn't make me a wealthy man, but uh, you know that that was just my wrestling's my passion, and uh, you know whether I stay in the wrestling business or uh, I have to let it go, it'll always be a part of my life in some small way. You know, uh, my my booking business will always my in your face entertainment business will always will always be there. So uh, uh, you know, I'm not sure where the road's going to take me right now. I got a lot of irons in the fire in a lot of different places, but uh, definitely look back at WCW and in a, in a, in a great light you know it's funny uh and i know i'm i'm rambling here but i guess i'm a ring announcer that's what i do so i apologize <laughs> but um but uh uh it's funny you know when we were on the road uh and we we're on the road when things were really hectic and things were great we we're on the road 25 days a, a month and i mean it was it was brutal uh and we you know bitched and moaned and complained and everything sucked and the, but this sucked and that sucked and you know what I don't think there's one person who wouldn't who, who 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 looks back and says, you know what, we had it great. We're on top of the world. We're selling out arenas. We we're flying first class. We were going, everything paid for, making a nice wage. Uh, you know, having a blast. Uh, you know, and I don't think anybody appreciated it at the time because we were worn down and I think we were spoiled. But Gary Capetta wants to. I, I called him at the height of the popularity of Monday Night Show and I said, Gary, I said, you know, how you doing? Blah blah blah. He goes, you guys are on fire, right? He goes. I said, yeah, we're, you know, we're just kicking butt. And he goes, uh, enjoy it. And I said, why do you say enjoy it? I thought maybe he was coming back to take my spot. I got nervous there. I said, why do you say enjoy it, Gary? And he goes, because it's not going to last. So enjoy the ride. And, I, you know, everybody thought that it was going to last, but uh, he was right. But it was a hell of a ride looking back on it. Hmm. As you say, you was um, with WCW during uh, all the top turmoil and the rise to the top. So but how did the company change when the NWO started? 
Um, you know, there just became a lot of, you know, I, as, 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 my, as, I, as WCW progressed and my time in WCW progressed, I got more involved. I was a production assistant. I did, uh, at one point, I was in charge of all the market-specific interviews, um, which were the interviews that went in the syndicated shows to promote the towns. Uh, yeah, I actually, towards the end, I was even on the booking, uh, the booking writing committee. Uh, I, I was a talent relations assistant, so I did a lot more than just ring announce as things progress, and which is always my, my work ethic is to do as much as I can, get my feet in as many places as I could. But um, uh, it just when the NWO came in, it just became a lot more, and I tried to stay out of it because I knew what my role was. But uh, you know, it just it, looking back, especially, it became a lot more politically motivated politically ambitious everybody seemed to be out for themselves where at first this was a group of guys a group of talent like flair and sting and 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 arn anderson and and barry windham and and, and just a bunch of guys that went from seeing uh 800 people at a house show to uh you know a sellout at 20,000 people in in chicago or 25,000 people you know and we're just so thrilled that you know that that the things had turned around it just seemed that, and I'm not blaming it on Kevin Nash or Scott Hall. I, I think it was just the, the, the cancer that invaded the company, and it wasn't any one person. It just became about how much money could everybody make and, and, and how much TV time could everybody get. And, you know, uh, it's just it, it kind of escalated from there, and, and the, the guys that were on top wanted more, and the guys that were below them wanted to be on top, and the guys that were below them, uh, you know, nobody was really happy. And, uh you know, there's a wrestler now in WWE who I, I don't even, to be honest with you, don't even know where he's been. I, I know he still works there, but uh, he's been off TV for a while. I don't want to mention any names, but he was uh, he was in WCW for about five or six years, a good friend of mine. And you know, he used to, God, he was miserable in WCW because he felt like he, you know, he, he, he deserved to be at the next level, and he always wanted to get out of his contract. He even asked a couple times and go to WWF at the time. And I told him, I said, you might, you know, you might, be a huge superstar there i said but you know what sometimes the grass isn't always greener and uh and he called me about six months ago he goes <laughs> he goes you're right this this <laughs> this is just as bad and i don't know if wwe is just as bad i i'm not i don't don't go to their shows i don't really follow their product to be honest with you other than every once in a while I'll catch it on television i have the most respect for them because they're the last remaining major company um you know in in the in, in the profession right now in the u.s that uh you know could pay salaries and 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 uh you know, have a full road schedule and have has a television product uh, nationally. So I respect WWE and wouldn't want to blame him. But this guy did say he said, you know what, you know, and and I get back to it. Everybody uh, in WCW, I think, would look back now and and realize how good they had it and maybe do it a different way. Mm. Speaking of doing things a different way, and since you said you were on the booking committee, uh, one of the things many of our guests talk about is the way the NWO never really had a payoff in that, you know, they, blo they broke it up into the black and white and the black and red, and that never really uh, culminated in any kind of a match or angle or anything. Um, if you were in charge of the booking committee in 1998, how would you have handled the demise of the NWO? Oh God, I don't know. I mean, I think that, that that there should have been one like World, you know, World Series or Super Bowl or World Cup of uh, of wrestling, you know, uh, winner take all, NWO against uh, WCW, and and I think you know eventually, if, if if the in hindsight, you know, hindsight being 2020 is really easy. You know, when you have to book, and I was talking to somebody about this a uh, uh, couple a couple last week in Buffalo at a show I promoted uh, with uh, the Buffalo Bisons baseball team. I mean, if you guys think about it, every week we had five hours of live television. Five hours of live TV, mm. three hours on Monday, which is, I can't believe that any wrestling fan would sit through three hours of Nitro. I was watching tapes last night, and I was thinking to myself, when, how did I sit through all this? <laughs> I, I mean, know. you know, three hours is a long time. Right. And, and then two hours of thunder, and, and, and so, I mean, it's easy to sit back and say, God, they should have done this, or you should have done that, or you could have done that, uh, without knowing that... To, to produce five hours of television with the egos and the injuries and 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 different you know different uh, people having control over different things is just it's very hard to say. I mean, I guess in hindsight it should have been built up a WCW against the NWO, you know, who, who's going to take over the company um, and have a big blow off event and then uh, you know get rid of the NWO. But um, you know, I don't. I, I wasn't on the booking committee then. I didn't have a, a, a that kind of role uh, at that point in the company that I even knew what was going on in the inner circle, other than just things you would hear. So, I, you know, uh, it's very easy to be a, a Monday morning quarterback, but uh, it, 
to go through the craziness of having to deal with all those hours of television. Plus, don't forget, we had Saturday, two hours of Saturday night we had to tape and and house shows and 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 it just it was it was. I think it just it, it got too big too fast, mm-hmm. it, to be honest with you. And um, you know, I think when anything gets too big too fast, the egos spiral out of control. Uh, people get burnt out on the road. People get burnt out in their jobs. Uh, you know, you can't get enough people in there to, to, to you know, to handle all the production and, all, you know, everything. And uh, not that WCW didn't have its faults and not that there weren't people involved that didn't have their faults. But, you know, it just it got real big real quick. And, you know, you're talking about seven hours of first-run television uh, every week. That's a lot for a company that was just used to doing, you know, uh, the Saturday night taping uh, every 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 couple of weeks and and uh, every three weeks to do a syndicated taping, you know. So that's a big jump. Mm. What was your opinion when Eric Bischoff was brushed out as the leader of WCW and Bill Bush was put in his place? You know, again, you get caught up in the emotion. You know, everybody thought, you know, almost like Ding Dong the Witch is Dead type of thing. But you, you know, again, the grass isn't always greener. Uh, I, I I didn't. I just, you know, my my thing was always I I, I love my job. I loved being part of the company. I loved being on the road. I loved what I did, and I try not to get up caught up in the politics. Although it's hard, Eric was, uh, you know, so he, you know, had said himself, you know, when he came back after that, he got totally burnt out and uh, and and reacted to some situations and then got and was very volatile in some situations, and. Uh, I think at that point it was just like, you know, thank God we have a break because, uh, you know, Eric was very hard to, to deal with. But I think, you know, he, he, he'll be the, probably the first one to admit that. But, you know, looking back on that whole regime, it didn't, it, it made it the Eric Bischoff regime almost look like, uh, you know, uh, you know, the difference between uh, McDonald's and your neighborhood burger joint. So, uh, hmm. you know, at the time it was, I think people were happy for a change. I think people were real stressed out and thought that this might be uh, uh a better, a better regime, but um, you know, and Bill Bush, I think, was a good guy. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I think he was brought in mainly to cut costs, and uh, you know, because he was a he was an accountant. Uh, I think uh, he didn't know the wrestling business. Uh, he knew how to cut costs, and uh, so you know, he did some some things well. Probably made some mistakes, but uh, you know, everything just went by so quick. Uh, uh, you know. It, it 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 was a it was it was a real quick ride. It was like going on Space Mountain, but it lasted uh you know the the ride lasted uh, thirty seconds, but this ride lasted about five years and felt like thirty seconds. Mm-hmm. I think it was more than five years actually, from Nitro to Nitro. What was it? Six years? Yeah, Nitro started on uh, September 4, nineteen ninety five. Don't ask me how I remember the states and stuff. That's impressive. <laughs> Dan, you want to take the next one? Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think the impact was that Vince Russo had on WWE? You know, everybody, everybody that, that knows me thinks I hate Vince Russo as a person. I don't hate Vince Russo as a person. I'll make that very clear. I think Vince Russo is a hell of a guy. I think he's a nice guy. Um, just because you don't agree with somebody's philosophy doesn't mean that you, uh, you know, and I didn't say this at the time. It was none of my business. But, you know, the, the hindsight, you know, and, and now, you know, we could all talk freely, I guess. You know, I just, I think Vince Russo tried to bring the WWE product to WCW, but in doing so, I believe, made it to be like WWE light, WWF light. You know what I mean? It was like a, a cheap version of, of, uh, of WWF. And uh, I think the one thing that set us apart, even in, when things were crazy and hectic, was that we were different. Uh, you know, we weren't doing the, you know, crazy backstage vignettes, and we weren't changing people's characters to... Uh, you know, all the time, and it just, I, I just didn't, I, you know, having girls fight guys and Nitro girls fight each other, and I, I just didn't, it just didn't do anything for me. It seemed like, you know, it worked for WWF and whatever structure they were, they were going about with their crash television formula at that time, but uh, it just didn't seem to work for us. It made us look like a watered-down version of what they were doing, and, um, uh, I, you know, I, I just I have a vision still to this day of wrestling, and I may be the I may be crazy, but I just think that if you put good story, I, I think wrestling is based on emotion. Um, mm-hmm. Whether you want it, it's emotion of cheering the your favorite wrestler, or booing the one that you hate, or or wanting to see a finish to a to a, a series of matches that ha- that it hasn't had a finish, and 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 being on the edge of your seat for pin, near near pinfalls, I, and 
I just think that if you if you book a wrestling product without the the craziness and the 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 TNA and I don't mean TNA as an NW TNA but you know, <laughs> TNA TNA you know uh, girls and mm. there's not a place for girls in, in wrestling. Um, and you just have cohesive storylines that, that, that make the fans, that bring the emotion back. I, I mean, I believe that there's a place for that in this day and age in professional wrestling. doesn't mean, you know, old school wrestling where you grab a, a hold for 45 minutes or, you know, like the old Jack Briscoe, Dory Funk Jr. classics. You know, that, that you're never going to be able to go back to that. Uh, wrestling's evolved. It's, you know, become high-flying, high-spot style wrestling. And, and, and you, know, I, you know, I understand that. And, you know, some people may say, well, you know, who the, who the hell is David Penzer to say what his opinion of wrestling is? I'm, I'm nobody. I'm, I'm a fan. I just believe that, uh, that, that there is a place for it. And, you know, my, I'm an eight-year-old son who loves professional wrestling, and he can't watch what's on TV right now. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm not, I don't keep up really with the TNA product, and I guess from what I hear they've cleaned it up a bit. Um, mm -hmm. But, I, you know, I'm not... I, it, 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 he has to go to bed anyway, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, even if I was going to pay for the product every week, you know, he is school. But what well, I was I, impressed. I dream of the day that my son could turn on wrestling on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday evening or a Saturday night, 6 o'clock time slot like I used to, and, mm -hmm. and watch wrestling the way I used to watch it, and, and you know, with storylines and good guys and bad guys and, and uh, you know, and, and, me, and not, you know, not having to worry about some of the more adult aspects of it, which I know that, you know, they've gone to because of the... Uh, the, just the way that the world's evolved. Mm. Hi, Neil. Okay, you just take the next one. Sure. How did Brad Siegel affect WCW? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for throwing me that curveball, that fastball. <laughs> that. Uh, you know, a lot of people uh, want to point fingers at who is to blame for the downfall of, of World Championship Wrestling. And... Uh, uh, some people want to say it was Eric Bischoff, which I don't think it was. Some people want to say it was Vince Russo, I don't think it was, or or Hulk Hogan, which I certainly don't think it was. Or you know, there's a variety of people that people want to blame. If wrestling fans want to blame somebody for the demi demise of WCW and the downfall of WCW and the reason why WCW no longer exists, there's one person to blame. His name is Brad Siegel. He was the head at the time of Turner uh, Networks. He hated wrestling, hated the politics involved and was waiting for the opportunity to uh, f to be in a position to where uh, he could bring somebody in, and that gentleman's name was Jamie Kellner, who uh, would share, who he could, you know, who would share his, uh, his feeling about professional wrestling. And they could go over Turner's head because uh, at the time, you know, Turner's, Ted Turner's power was dwindling because of the... Uh, the AOL and Time Warner mergers had both taken him a few pegs down. And basically the story goes, uh, and I don't know if it's ever been told, that Jamie Kellner walked in, uh, went, went to, uh, to Steve Case, the, uh, the a CEO of uh, AOL, and basically said, I want wrestling off the air. It's not what I, what I see as programming on my network. And that was basically instigated by Brad Siegel. And by going over Turner's head and going to Steve Case, they, they canned it, and that's what killed it. And Eric and Fusion Media tried to, to get it going, but once it was off the air, there was nothing that anybody could have done except for just sell it off. And uh, that's what they did. So that's the short version. So maybe someday I'll write a book and give the long, intricate version. But basically, Brad Siegel is the reason why WCW no longer exists. He, uh, in the last year of WCW, gave no um, uh, personal support very little financial support uh, there was there was a time there at the end where there was basically nobody in charge uh, mm. after Bill Bush left and Eric Eric left and I mean who, who was in charge uh, we used to sit and book in, in these in these variety meetings and Ed Farrar would say well you know what I'm writing I'm writing the final script so I guess I'm in charge you know and, and nobody knew it you know who could say you know was Craig Leathers in charge I mean there was nobody in charge and, and they begged Brad Siegel to put somebody in charge make somebody anybody you know, mm -hmm. David Benzer, Disco Inferno, Wildcat Willie. Put somebody in charge. Give somebody, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the 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 opportunity to be able to uh, to 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 say yay or nay uh, on certain things. And he never did it. And uh, basically, uh, the rest is history. And uh, so, for all the pundits of Russo and Bischoff and Hogan and all the people that everybody thinks that put WCW out of business, uh, you could. Uh, 
If you ever see Brad Siegel walking down the street, you can shake his hand and thank him for, not, for WCW not being around anymore because he is the person. Mm. Pretty stiff, huh? Yeah. Would you, yeah. Dan, do I take this? I, I was always told that if you tell the truth, nobody could, nobody could, uh, nobody could come back and, and say a thing to you. So. Mm. After being so involved in WCW, did you ever think that it, com it would completely die the way that it did? No, we were like I said, we were going so fast. I mean, you know, I, when we were uh, before Nitro started, when we were you know doing real real bad, and Turner had basically said, you know, I want to, you know, I'm going to keep this thing going even if it loses a ton of money because, you know, it, wrestling got me on the map. Uh, you know, we, we were nervous back in those days, pre Nitro days. Um, mm. You know, but. We, we we never we never saw that coming. Uh, I mean, towards the end, yeah, we did. You know, when they started selling it, when they sold it to Fusion, and then you know, all of a sudden, there was like six month period of of nobody knew what was going on. Yeah, it was very nerve wracking. But uh, you know, still, I always thought that in the end, uh, some somebody would save it or some somebody would come and pick it up. And when I looked on the uh, the internet and saw the WCW said uh, it said WW and WWF website, it said WWF with their logo purchases and then WCW logo on the on the bottom uh, it was a pretty emotional moment for me actually I was sitting in my house in uh, in South Atlanta Georgia and mm. I realized that was the end and uh, all I could do is go out one more time on a Monday night and give it my all and have a blast and a good time and uh, and see where my career took me and that's what I did and uh, I've been lucky I've, 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 I've done some good stuff what was involved with the XWF which was challenging uh, in a lot of different ways and our next question is about that actually yeah, I was a tour, tour manager and media um, relations and uh, publicist for Roddy Piper's book tour which was challenging in a lot of ways and very successful for me and um, you know doing doing a few things now in the wrestling business including the comp my, my booking company so um, uh, it's a uh, I've been pretty blessed um, in terms of uh, what's happened after WCW compared to some of the other uh, people involved but uh, yeah it was uh, nobody nobody saw uh, yeah we saw it coming at the end uh, I'd say the last six months but it, and it was very 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 stressful the last six or eight months um, working there and not having any clue what was going on but knowing you had to produce a product and not knowing you know you know when, when, when it was all going to end but uh, I think until the dying day I think most everybody figured it was going to they were going to salvage it somehow uh, but they didn't. So you just go on with your life. Mm -hmm. uh, you just mentioned the XWF. Um, you remarked yesterday that the true story has never been told. So can we have that story? Well, yeah. The, basically, the true story of the XWF is I, I was contacted by um, by Brian Knobs and Greg Valentine, and they brought Jimmy Hart in to to work on this project. And um, we we moved in this gorgeous office overlooking uh, uh, Tampa Bay and. Uh, they actually moved me and my family down to uh, to Tampa after a while and uh, put me on a, uh, a salary and uh, we taped. Uh, uh, I was the head of talent relations for XWF and worked in the writing team. I, I we just did every. We, we there was a very small staff, so we did everything from the finished product of actually going in and editing and 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 doing the editing to the website to talent relations to you know uh, booking the house shows and. It was mostly a team effort. Everybody worked together. But, um, you know, I, I, I all along figured that, you know, they're not going to go in and, and produce, you know, $2 million or $1 million worth of television, 10 episodes of TV, unless, you know, they figured they had somebody, you know, they had a network. And, you know, I just always thought, hey, you know, uh, they're not going to tell us. They want to keep it secret. You know, they, they don't want it to get out. You know, I can understand that, you know, but I, I, I had to, I thought in my mind that, you know, how could you put all this money in unless you know you at the end of the tunnel, you know, if you if you come to, you know, uh, you have an agreement with somebody that if you produce a decent product, it's going to go, it's going to get on the air. And in hindsight, I don't think they ever had one. And if they did, I never knew about it, never found out about it. Um, uh, I think they just thought that they could take their product around, the wrestling product around and get it on the air. And, um they did actually um, come real close with um, uh, on Fox uh, Television, but what, what was real hard was by the time that um, that it, the, the time it took to edit the tapes and 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 go around and go to to um, to the uh, the convention, the uh, NAPTI convention, to try to sell it, and there was so much interest in it. But then what happened was, you know, uh, WWE, uh, you know, started taking some talent back and. Uh, 
uh, you know, so you'd go to a television company and you'd say, uh, they'd say, oh, we love this tape, you know, we especially we love uh, Lawler on commentary. Well, yeah, but uh, he's not here anymore. Oh, okay, well, uh, but yeah, but we love Kurt Hennig, you know, and him and Bobby Heenan. Yeah, but Kurt's Kurt's gone too. But that kid Josh Matthews, who's who's up and coming from Tough Enough, man, he's an underdog. We love, well, we don't really have we don't really have Josh, but but Gene Oakland, I mean, he's the dean. Of, yeah, but you know, okay, so who do you have, you know? And it, it just got to the point where uh, where it, it took so long between point A and point B that you know, and, and they couldn't, they didn't have the or want to, you know, put in the the money to to keep you know all of the talent there when they didn't have a uh, revenue stream coming in. That um, by the time they really had some some eager people that uh, wanted to uh, to be involved, uh, just there wasn't a lot of the talent that was in the. Uh, original pilot so it's sort of hard to sell a it's like it would be like going to a to a television network with a comedy project and uh you know that you know say like friends uh, but and and they said oh my god these six people these three girls and three guys have such chemistry together you know we want to put it on the air yeah yeah but we only got three of them left <laughs> okay we'll come back when you got another uh, another one with, with 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 three new ones you know what i mean right so it was sort of um sort of a Ass backwards way of, of of doing it, um, but I I think that in in defense of the XWF and the people by, the money people behind it, they did not perceive that uh, the cable industry would have such a, a negative feeling on wrestling, and 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 I think that you know when uh, USA lost wrestling to Viacom, when Viacom bought uh, WWE's products, they bought the rights to it. Um, USA, of course, said that, you know, well, wrestling's not in our demographic and never really made us a lot of money anyway. You know, what are they going to say? We just lost our flagship. So they said that, and, and when WCW was sold to WWE, uh, you know, TNT, and then they said, you know, well, it was the number one rated show on the network and uh, in the top ten on the uh, on, on the cable ratings, but uh, we, it just didn't fit our demographic, and we it never really made us any money. And, and so, you know, cable, uh, you know, the you know, it's, People in that industry read that, and they say to themselves, well, you know, USA and TNT and TBS are all saying that, you know, we had a, one of the top-rated shows on television, but we don't care that we lost it or we got rid of it on purpose. You know, what, what, why should any other cable executive take a chance on a wrestling show? So it, it almost was, uh, uh, it almost was uh, dead before we got out the door, but I, I don't think we knew it or we thought that that would happen that way. Hmm. You're involved in Roddy Piper's book tour. How did you enjoy working with Roddy? Roddy is a uh, God. Roddy's a, uh, a great person, a very interesting person, a very complex person. I, I used to joke with Roddy Piper that uh, you know I never knew which Roddy I was going to get from day to day. Uh, you know, mm. just when he, we got, when, you know, we were on a uh, uh, Billy Ray Cyrus's Crazy Train tour bus for about 30, 35, 40 days, and you know when Roddy, when we got uh, Roddy, I think <laughs> made a couple mistakes when he hired me to be his tour manager. I said, Roddy. How much press do you want me to, to get you in each of these towns? And he said, I want as much as you could get me. Uh, he didn't know David Penzer that well. So basically, every town we went to, we would drive in and uh, on the bus, and he would be I would wake him up at 5 in the morning, and we'd have uh, about six, eight radio spots, and then we'd have, um, you know, a good morning, you know, Good Morning Texas or Good Morning Dallas or whatever that show is, and then he'd have about an hour to sleep to go back and take a rest or whatever or try to get a workout in, and then I'd have him booked on the afternoon sports talk shows. And So uh, I think uh, uh, Roddy kind of tapped out <laughs> after the first week and said, all right, you know, 10 interviews max. But no, he you know, he was a trooper, and he, he made everyone, and he was tremendous to everyone. But um, it just uh, it, it was a tremendous strain, uh, uh doing a tour like that in such a short period of time on a, on a tour bus, but I think it was very successful. I learned a lot working with Roddy. Uh, I consider him a friend, and um, we don't work together anymore, but I wish him the best of luck. It was, a, it was an interesting experience, and it, it gave me a lot of context. I made a ton of context in the media, and uh, you know, I got Roddy on Best Damn Sports Show and Wayne Brady and had him booked on a couple others before he went back to WWE, and they sort of took over the uh, the, publicity, the publicist part of things. But uh, you know, some 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 major uh, marketing and media corporations that Roddy had hired, um, uh, you know, pretty much because I had recommended them uh, to promote the book tour, couldn't get Roddy on these shows, and just through sheer will, which has always been, I've done everything through sheer will and not giving up and never say no. Uh, I was able to. 
to, I guess, pester these people enough to, or charm them enough, one or the other, to where they uh, they put Roddy on. And um, uh, you know, so uh, it's just uh, it was it was very rewarding. I made a lot of contacts and um, uh, made me showed me that I could take do something, you know, uh, basically that I had no very little experience in. And be successful at it. So it was, it was a good. It was a good lesson for me. It was an entertaining time. Being on the road with Roddy Piper 30 days has to be entertaining. You could bet, bet your bottom dollar on that. <laughs> uh, you also filmed Roddy's uh, Piper gets pissed shooting for you. Um, how real was Roddy's emotion when he re reacted to the quote that his son made? Oh, it was pretty real. Roddy had uh, Roddy had told us uh, that uh, you know nothing was off limits except for you know he, he doesn't obviously discuss his early childhood he doesn't like to and i respect that and and that's his prerogative uh, uh never talk to him about it and um but he doesn't cover it in his book but he basically said anything from what i started my book to what's going on now is uh it's fair game i had that it was a real touchy subject because you know one thing that isn't fair game is his family but since he had brought his, his son on the road it sort of became fair game so i sort of made the decision to uh to you know shoot with it and if uh if you didn't want to talk about it i think i think the way i word it is if uh this is too uncomfortable for you or you don't want to talk about it you know let's just pass on and uh it, no it was pretty emotional and Roddy's an emotional guy he uh you never know you know he runs the gamut of 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 you know the the high strung roddy piper that you see you know hosting piper's pits and babbling and and then on the the, the radio talk shows that you know talking about the snookas and the, the snook incident and the coconut and that, that whole deal and and but roddy piper the person Rod, roddy to rod tombs is a very quiet soft-spoken person um and uh so there's a lot, lot of uh, differences of emotion between roddy piper and rod tombs and uh, i think that interview and subsequent interviews that he's done uh I think you've seen a combination of of both care both people and i think they're both two separate people uh mm -hmm. But that was real emotion. There's nothing scripted about that. Mm. Recently, or more recently, you did the WWA tour in New Zealand. Uh, the, I forget the name of it. Reckoning pay-per-view, I think it was. Um, what is your memory of working with that? And, and uh, would you, if it, another pay-per-view came up in the future, would you work for them again? Oh, absolutely. That was a blast. Um, I had a, I had a blast on that. Um, first of all, I love Australia. It was the second time over there, and uh, I just think it's a beautiful country. So I jumped at the chance to go back to Australia and see New Zealand. Um, I was given the chance to have an input in some of the, 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 the booking and of the matches and actually came up with the idea of doing the four-way elimination uh, torn, uh, uh, cruiserweight match. Mm. And... Uh, so, I mean, uh, I work with a gentleman named Scott Damore, who I actually used to book as an uh, enhancement guy in WCW. So he used to give me, like, uh, I think a $10 booking fee. And uh, and that, then he was my boss on this tour, so I had to give him a $10 booking fee, I guess. But, uh, I, Scott, I still owe you the money. But uh, uh, it was very, for me, it was very satisfying um, to go out. I know the tour didn't do that great, and, you know, WWE was coming in behind them, and, and you know, it was a low-budget tour other than Sting and Bret Hart and Jeff and a couple other people. It was uh, mostly names that I, I don't think wrestling fans would be familiar with over there. Uh, but very talented bunch of bunch of people. Um, guys like Joe Legend and Chris Sabin and Frankie Kazarian and, and you know, just they're, they're extremely talented. A uh, bunch of people. Um, guys like Joe Legend and Chris Sabin and Frankie Kazarian and, and you know, just they're, they're extremely talented. Uh, but uh, it was very satisfying for me because to go out there and be a part of a pay-per-view that was, there was no skits, there was no lesbians, there was no, not that there's anything wrong with lesbians, believe me, <laughs> but, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, in, in wrestling-wise, wrestling there was no, there, it was just wrestling. It was, it was basically a wrestling pay-per-view, and, uh, you know, the few people that saw it all loved it, and I wish more people could have seen it because it just, it, it made me believe that... It, like like I talked about earlier, my vision of what wrestling could be, uh, which is which is shared by a lot of people that I talk to. It's not just my vision. I mean, I'm not taking credit for it. It's just my personal uh, vision of what I would love to see wrestling, uh, or see at least a promotion be. Uh, I understand that you know the what I, what my vision of wrestling is is probably not a lot of other people's, and and I respect anybody who has a different vision, and as long as it's wrestling and it's good for the bottom the bottom line not to get off the subject of the WWA pay-per-view but um the bottom line is anybody out there that's promoting wrestling whether I 
think it's the greatest thing in the world or the worst thing in the world. Uh, it, it's keeping the business going. It's keeping young talent developing. It's keeping fans interested. And, and so, you know, I, I would never criticize any wrestling promotion. Um, I may not agree with, with or like or, or, or let my kids watch everything they do, but the bottom line is it's wrestling, uh, sports entertainment, whatever you want to call it, and it's my, that's my passion. And um, uh, so, you know, I, I never don't want anybody to think I'm criticizing anything. I have an opinion, but um, well, that's just my personal opinion, and I know there's a lot of people out there who probably don't agree with it, and that's their, that's their prerogative and opinion. But getting back to WWA, uh, it was very, for me, professionally satisfying to be a part of something that I almost proved to, if nobody else, to myself, uh, that you could go out there and have a hot audience and, and put on a, a real good show and, and you know, and, plan, and the people would react. And that was emotion you saw there. It was, you know, uh, people were excited, people were, were pissed, people were awed, people were, uh, you know, just so, so many different emo emotions, you know. Uh, Brett, when, when they were moved, when Bret Hart came out and made the speech, I mean, it was just... Uh, uh, that's what that's what, uh, you know I, I think there could be more pay-per-views like that i don't know if it's going to be with wwa i haven't talked to andrew mcmanus i know he has other uh, a lot of other he, he's basically a concert promoter but yeah uh you know whether it's with them or another promotion or or, or, or anywhere i would uh you know i i would love to be a part of something else like that because i thought it was very 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 professionally satisfying to be a part of it dan would you like to do the next one um, as you mentioned before, you're now running your in-your-face bookings business. Um, for those running indie shows, how can they contact you, and uh, who might they be able to deal with? Uh, yeah, I got a uh, company. Basically, I had started it as in-your-face booking, which was in-your-face was an XWF slogan, and I had originally started it as a, uh, a way to get some of the uh, uh, XWF guys booked while we were trying to figure out what was going on in the XWF. And uh, it's still inyourfacebookings.com is the... Uh, the website in your face bookings with an s dot com um, and um, basically i it's it's basically a complete uh a complete uh one stop source for booking wrestling talent whether it be for an independent show whether it be a, a, a fan um, a fan con wrestling fan convention whether it be uh, autograph session, whether it be to book an entire event. We've done some real successful events in Gainesville, Georgia. We've done uh, with uh, USA Championship Wrestling with uh, the Buffalo Bisons and, 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 and other events. Uh, I'm working on an event right now uh, in Hawaii. I work real hard with a, a, a company out of Finland called uh, uh, Bahala Pro Wrestling. And um, they just had their first event and they're scheduled to have um, a big event called Baltic Brawl with Sting and Jeff Jarrett and Jimmy Hart and Ted DiBiase and myself and, and so many other talented guys, Jerry Lynn and AJ Styles uh, on the 27th of September. So wow. everything from, uh, you know, every uh, if, if somebody wants to book a Hacksaw Jim Duggan, a Buff Bagwell, a Jimmy Hart, a Terry Funk, Bobby Heenan, Jeff Jarrett, Conan, Rick Steiner, Saturn, Shane Douglas, I mean, the list goes on and on. You know, one talent, two talents, you know, an entire card, uh, autograph session, a fan festival, um, uh, should basically a one-stop uh, uh booking service uh i have uh, on probably 90 percent of the uh free agents in um in the business are available through my site and uh through my connections in the business for the years i've been around um i could basically get anybody so even people that aren't available on my site or you don't see their picture on my site or their name uh i have access to so any promoters or or uh, uh sports store sports collectible store owners anybody that uh would like to uh, book some talent, I uh, encourage you to come to inyourfacebookings.com. Um, you can contact me, uh, David Penzer, all one word, at inyourfacebookings.com, and um, all that information is on the site. Uh, we have some new talent that we just added, uh, uh, wrestlers such as uh, Justin Credible, uh, Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, Sean Stasiak, Powers of Pain are back together, Mike Awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Living legend Larry Zabisco, Grand Gallant, Grand Grill and Luna, um, and we're. Oh, I'm always talking to you know uh, talent about adding them to the site. It's it's not exclusive. Um, also, all the TNA wrestlers are available through my site, uh, as a sister site really called TNA Bookings. But you could get you could access that at inyourfacebookings.com. So, um, it's been real. It's been real lucrative, and uh, I you know just want to. I think the wrestlers enjoy working with somebody they consider one of the boys and. Uh, you know, somebody that has been on the road and knows that, you know, they need to 
what their air, airfare need, you know, they, when they need to get in, and you know, just somebody that, that knows what it's like to be on the road and make sure that these guys will get taken care of. Um, you know, I know a lot of independent promoters like to call. You know, if they book six guys for a show, they want to call them and they want to talk to them and they want to, you know, you know, that's part of the process and I guess part of the fun. But uh, it takes a it's a it takes a lot of stress off of. Um, off of a promoter to be able to deal with one person and, and have me do the rest of the legwork or my staff do the rest of the legwork, which is calling all the talent and finding out where they're flying in and out of and flying out of and, uh, you know, what their real names are to put on the plane ticket and, you know, getting setting up the interviews to promote the shows. and That's what we do. So uh, I would encourage any independent uh, promoter or anybody that wants to book any talent to mm -hmm. check it out. Uh, keep the boiler. You want to keep the guys working, so keep the business going and, uh, Hopefully the wrestling business will uh, stay and become more healthy as uh, the years go on. Thanks. That's inyourfacebookings.com. Um, you can check out the link um, at any time in the contact section of the interactiveinterview.com, which has just been added, uh, to help rotate and help the business grow with the bookings, which we've had a few studies. Um, so yeah, that's great. Next, um, before we uh, round up... Do you want to take it, Dan? I, I think I'll, yeah, I'll take it. Okay, good. Before we round up, can we give you some uh, word association? Sure. Next, you can uh, just give one word answer, or you can, as you've got a story you'd like to tell, you can do that. However, whichever yeah. one you want to do. Sure. Uh, first one we've got is uh, Buff Bagwell. Buff Bagwell. Buff gets a lot of heat. Uh, some of it he probably does deserve. Some of it he doesn't. He's always been good to me. Uh, he's battled some demons in his life. Uh, I think he's he's winning the battle. Um, he's always showed up when he's supposed to show up for uh, for any show that I've booked him on, um, and. Uh, I think if he continues to win the battle against some of the demons that are out there in the business, I think uh, uh, hopefully uh, there'll be a lot of success in uh, the future for Buff. Roddy Piper. Roddy Piper. Uh, Roddy Piper was one of my favorite wrestlers growing up, and um, uh, Piper's pits were classic, and uh, so it was uh, a lot of fun and a great experience uh, working for him, and um, he came and hired me at a time where I was looking uh, sort of lost looking for something to do and, and uh, we'll always be grateful for him believing in me and um, uh, uh, we'll always consider him a friend. Sting. Sting's a good guy. Sting is, uh, is one of those guys that never really let success get to his head. Um, he, um, he's the same guy I met when I first uh, brought the first carload of people into the, uh, into the, where were we? I think it was the uh, Georgia Mountain Center and the Marietta Civic Center in the in, in uh, suburban Atlanta, but uh, he's a he's a good guy. He's uh, he's changed his life. He's um, he's born again Christian, and um, he he lives by what he preaches. And uh, I'm, you know there are some people that don't live by what they preach, and but he certainly lives by it. He uh, he's, he's enjoying time with his family, uh, doing a show here and there, and uh, I think he's a super guy. DDP. Diamond Dallas Page. I just saw DDP in Buffalo, as a matter of fact. It's, uh, it was good to see him. Um, uh, Page is somebody who, you know, they said would never be a star, would never be a champion, would never be a hit. And, you know, people could say that it was because he was friends with Eric Bischoff. And, you know, I guess being friends with Eric Bischoff probably didn't hurt. But there's no there's no denying that, you know, that, that he had uh, talent and charisma and, and a passion for what he did that sometime or almost an overpassion for what he did that got him to where he was able to, to, to go in the heights he was able to achieve. So you got to give a guy credit. You know, uh, like I say, you know, a lot of what I've achieved has been through determination and, and, uh, and, and craziness and, and just a lot of uh, hard work. And, and I think Dallas Page uh, achieved what he achieved through a lot of the same. Hulk Hogan. Hulk's a good guy. I never really got to know Hulk too well until uh, he w we were working at the beginning stages of the XWF. I uh, uh, gotten to know him. I, you know, he's, I wouldn't say he's you know one of my best buddies, but I've gotten to know him, and uh, he's a uh, he, he's a good guy. I, I remember that you know Hulk's always gotten a lot of uh, you know people have always in the internet media and the wrestling newsletter community have always been negative towards Hulk for a lot of reasons and a lot of ways. But I just, you know, I, the, the Hulk I know is a guy that will, you know, go sign, you know, autographs at a charity and not nobody will know about it. We'll go read the night before Christmas uh, to uh, uh, underprivileged kids every year here in Tampa and, and 
with all the big baseball stars and football stars and that, that come in and participate, Hulk still gets the biggest reaction. Uh, he's larger than life. He's uh, just his presence is larger than life, and uh, I think he's a he's a he's a great guy. Um, I, it's an honor for me to be able to work with him and to be able to, to uh, continue, hopefully continue to, to to know him and and work with him. And I help, helped his uh, daughters out uh, when they were doing their uh, when she was doing her um, her uh, showcase down in Orlando, and that was a a great experience too. So I, I just think I think he's a he's a he's a fabulous person. And I think that he'll always be the Babe Ruth of, Babe Ruth of wrestling. He's larger than life. He has that look with the tan and the, the mustache and the you know the the, the bandana and uh, you know that's just it's gonna Hulk Hogan's gonna be. You ask anybody that's not a wrestling fan, right? You mentioned wrestling. Nine out of ten of them are gonna say Hulk Hogan. I don't think that's gonna change uh, uh, for a long, 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 long time to come, if ever. Tiff Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett is a good friend of mine. Uh, he, uh, somebody I got to know pretty well in WCW. We both sometimes had philosophical differences of what wrestling should be. Um, but uh, uh, Jeff works real hard. Uh, you know, there's some. Uh, you know, it's hard to to wrestle, run a try to run a company on limited funds, and uh, you know, try to try to make it successful. But I, I respect Jeff and. I respect what they're doing. I respect, you know, although I don't watch TNA a lot, uh, a lot of their talent is some of the greatest young talent in the world. Uh, and they're just, they're, they're in a very tough spot because uh, wrestling has normally been told as a soap opera uh, on television to get you to either come to the live event or to get you to buy it on pay-per-view or, or whatever way to spend your money. But Jeff now has to not only enter... And, and the whole TNA crew have to find a way not only to entertain for two hours, but also entertain enough, entertain you and make you come back every week. And that, that's tough. I mean, that's, it's, it's easy when it's free TV. It's not, it's, as a matter of fact, it's not easy when it's free TV. It's even more impossible when, it, when you're trying to get people to pay $10. You have to entertain them and get them to, to pay $10 the next week. So uh, I respect Jeff Jarrett. Um, uh, he's a good, I consider him a good friend. And... Um, I wish him and TNA nothing but the best of luck because any, any like I said, any company, uh, large or small, that is uh, that's still in business at this point and um, and making a go of it uh, helps the wrestling business and you know uh, as a, as a whole. Kevin Nash. Kevin Nash, very witty guy, very funny guy, knows how to. Uh, uh, knows how to play the political game, uh, certainly as well as anybody, if not better than anybody. Um, and not the greatest, not 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 the greatest wrestler in the world. I think he'd admit that. Um, he uh, was very successful. He came into WCW at a time where his presence and Scott Hall's presence were uh, helped, uh, you know, make something very special happen. And. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think Kevin has, has saved his money, and, and I hope, uh, uh, you know, that he has happiness in his future. I have nothing personal against Kevin Nash. I don't know him that well. He's not one of my one of my buddies. He's just a casual acquaintance. Scott Hall? Oh, there's another guy with some personal demons. Scott Scott Hall, the person, is a very nice guy. Scott Hall, when he, um, when he gets out of control, um, is his own worst enemy. Uh, yeah, I've had my, uh, you know, uh, being on the road, you, you you have your own. Everybody has their own problems with with something or other, whether it be drinking or or, or, or pills or whatever, you know, or or you know, anxiety or whatever whatever the case may be. And and uh, you know, they say you know you can't um, until you walk a mile in somebody's shoes. You know, you can't uh, lay judgment on them. Uh, Scott, I hope his his has gotten his life back together. I haven't heard a lot about what Scott's doing. Uh, I know he's trying to be a father, uh, and as a father, that's something I respect. And I hope that, um, I hope Scott finds happiness, because I know he hasn't been happy a lot in the time that I've known him. And uh, everybody deserves to be happy in life, because you only live once. Okay. Bobby Heenan. Bobby Heenan is one of the legitimately wittiest guys, if not the wittiest guy I've ever met. Um, when I was in college, in my not going to class days that we talked about earlier, uh, we used to sit around and watch wrestling and do whatever we did to laugh and have a good time. And I used to, I used to say, man, if I could just sit and have a drink with Bobby Heenan one time, you know, uh, man, wouldn't that be a blast? 
and I got a, ch <laughs> I got a chance to sit and have many cocktails with Bobby, and to know Bobby real well. And Bobby is uh, is, is is hilarious. Um, I know he's uh, he's fighting some health problems, that I think he's winning the battle. Um, I just actually spoke to his wife yesterday. He was he wasn't there, uh, but. Um, Bob, I, could, I, I consider Bobby Heenan a friend, and if you'd have told me 20 years ago that I'd be sitting on the phone saying I consider Bobby Heenan a friend and Hulk Hogan a friend and all these people friends, I'd have told you you were out of your mind. So, I mean, that just shows you what somebody could do uh, with a little luck and a lot of perseverance. But Bobby, Bob, I wish Bobby all the best, in his, in his, in, and I hope uh, he's healthy and uh, uh, could entertain uh, everybody for, for many, many more years to come. And the final one that I have is uh, Eric Bischoff. Like I said earlier, there's positives and negatives about Eric Bischoff. Uh, if it wasn't for Eric Bischoff, I wouldn't have been a ring announcer uh, for WCW, I don't believe. I wouldn't have uh, gotten many uh, raises that he went to bat for me. Um, I wouldn't have gotten the opportunities that I got. Um, on the other hand, uh, when, when, when you're working real hard um, and you're away from your family, I think uh, sometimes uh, for the boss to be uh, appreciative personable helps morale and Eric as he admits was not a people person uh, probably still isn't um, Eric has a very large ego and uh, you know for what he's accomplished um, even though it hasn't lasted uh, you know probably deserves to have one uh, there's good and bad about everybody um, and I wouldn't you know I, I want I would if I ever saw Eric again I would thank him for everything he did for me and no reason to bring up the bad. Just wish that sometimes, uh, you know, could have been a little bit more supportive of some of the lower card guys. But then again, we talked about it. Booking seven hours of TV a week, it's kind of hard to go up to David Penzer and say, hey, great job, how you doing? And shit, i got to go book seven hours of TV. Holy crap. So, <laughs> say some of that on TV. So, you know, it's all relative. But um, uh, just I find it kind of uh, unique that he's on, on Raw. And, and when he came out and hugged Vince McMahon, uh, certainly got a chuckle out of that. But, uh uh, I hope uh, you know. I hope Eric is uh, is content what he's doing because it's it's. I'm sure it's hard to go from being the boss to being an employee. James, do you have any? Yeah, I do. Um, Vampiro. Vampiro. Uh, Vampiro, I think is is a very talented wrestler. Uh, Vampiro is a character uh, inside the ring and out, more out. Uh, what can I say? You just never know. <laughs> you never know what he's going to do. You never know what he's going to say. You never know if it's going to happen or not. Um, I like Vampiro. I, uh, I think he's tremendously talented. Uh, he was going to be a focal part of a focal point of the XWF, and basically we're going to try to build the company around him as one of the lead baby faces. Uh, but um, you know, Vampiro is a character, and uh, like a lot of uh, characters in this business, um, that sometimes hurts you and sometimes helps you. And I think he's had a little bit of both in his career. How about uh, Kurt Henning? Oh, guy. Uh, I, I was uh, at the show that uh, show that me and Jimmy I uh, helped Jimmy promote uh, at the fairgrounds uh, in Tampa last year. Uh, a word that Kurt had passed and. Um, very emotional moment. Kurt Hennig was a, uh, a very funny, uh, very, just, I mean, always enjoyed life. Uh, loved to get on the stage and sing country music wherever he was. I got on a couple times with him. Uh, he's just, he was, uh, he was a fun guy. Uh, he was always ribbing, you know, having a, having, having a blast, laughing, and um, uh, just one of the many people in this business that uh, were taken away far too far too young and far too early and I've left behind children and families and it's a big shame but uh, he'll be missed along with many others it seems to be a bummer and say another one but how about Miss Elizabeth uh god that that one took me from out of left field and some of them you could you know you halfway aren't surprised um just knowing the, the, their personalities uh uh although I guess people that that were more were closer to her uh saw it coming um you know, Liz was, uh, you know, I, I, somebody that I didn't hang out with a lot. Um, you know, in wrestling, you have a few real good friends and a lot of pretty good friends and just other people that are just acquaintances. And uh, uh, I guess Liz would be an acquaintance and uh, would have been. Um, 
Uh, I guess uh, I don't. Uh, I don't really talk. I don't have a lot to say about her. I don't know what happened. I don't know what went wrong. You could predict what went wrong, and you could you could you could see the writing on the wall in so many cases of some of the tragic early deaths in this business. But uh, I couldn't have predicted it with her, and I wasn't a part of her inner circle, and I wasn't around. So I don't know what happened, but I know that uh, that uh, she was a classy person. Always treated everybody with class. Um, held herself with class, and um, I know she'll be missed as well. I don't have any more word associations, but I do have a question. One more. One more. Do you? All right, go ahead. Uh, Lydian Garcia. <laughs> God, she sings the national anthem great. <laughs> I've been, pract I've been practicing and practicing and practicing, but I just can't get the national anthem down as good as she can. <laughs> you know, the bottom line is, uh, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot of. Uh, I, I probably know where you're going with this. I, I, as a ring announcer, I don't. I, I, you know, she just she announces the matches. I don't know what they do off camera. I remember. Um, I remember when I did night show and I came back afterwards. Uh, Shane McMahon shook my hand and thanked me, which was the first time one of somebody in charge actually thanked me after a show. Which is the last time, but um. Uh, uh, he, he made a comment about, you know, uh, how, you know, couldn't believe how I worked the crowd. And, you know, anybody that's seen my style, I'm more of an MC than a ring announcer. And, you know, I get the crowd hyped up between matches and before the show. And I almost had to, you know, almost was not anything I invented when you're doing a three-hour night show and then a uh, and two-hour thunder. And then we did night show and thunder back-to-back. -back. You know, you almost have to be a cheerleader and an entertainer and an MC and a, an announcer all in one. I, I don't I don't go to their their shows. I don't know if that's what they do. Um, uh, I think they show videos and play music in between the, during the commercial breaks. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, so, uh, but um, Lillian Garcia uh, is a great singer. Um, uh, you know, she has a great spot. I hope she realizes how lucky she is to uh, to have that spot. Um, as far as myself and WWE. Um, uh, after the WCW invasion didn't work out, uh, I just figured that uh, unless something major happened, uh, you know, there probably wouldn't have been room for me because they had their announcers and they had their set crew, and uh, I, you know, uh, they t tend to be pretty. Uh, they tend to be pretty loyal to, to people like Howard Finkel, who I met as, as a matter of fact um, in Atlanta, and was a very cl total class act and uh, uh, probably the greatest wrestling ring announcer of all time, in my opinion. Uh, definitely the greatest wrestling ring announcer of all time. But as far as Lane Garcia goes, I just hope she realizes what a good gig she has and she enjoys it. And I uh, wish her luck in her in her career, both in music and in wrestling. I was about to ask a question, and we were calling Jimmy Hart several times before we um, uh, set up an interview date with him, which we have tentatively. I can't talk. Have tentatively. But uh, the question I have for you is, what what do you think the future is of the XWF, if anything? I don't know about the future of the XWF. Uh, I mean, basically, the XWF is dead. I mean, there's five tapes that are that that you know. I guess there's we have a little leeway of what we could do with it in terms of being able to generate revenue or coming into a, a country like we did in Puerto Rico, where we did an invasion angle and showed the tapes. Uh, you know, most of the wrestlers on them are are either you know injured. You know, like uh, you know, there's not a lot of the there's not a lot of continuity. There's uh, you know, you know, there's some wrestlers who have passed away, some wrestlers who have retired due to injury, some wrestlers, who, a lot of them who went to WWE. Uh, so, I mean, they're not really up-to-date tapes. As far as the future of the XWF goes, I don't know. As far as the future of David Penzer and Jimmy Hart goes... That's was the question. Uh, Jimmy's, uh, I don't want to say my, my business partner, but Jimmy's, uh, uh, I guess, one of my closest friends. Um, uh, uh, we have worked a lot of projects together. We continue to... Um, try to work a lot of projects together and um, I hope and pray and uh, that someday and hopefully sometime soon we'll be able to uh, to to bring our vision of wrestling to the masses uh, we continue to try and um, I don't know that we'll ever give up I don't know we'll ever be successful in getting there either so uh, you know but we you know we, we keep it rolling and Jimmy's a great guy Jimmy is the, the hardest working person I've ever met uh, this guy is, is up at the crack of dawn even if he has no sleep he could go to sleep at, fi at 5.30 in the morning and be up at 6 anyway uh, and uh, I mean you know just you know we'll do radio interviews and television promote I mean just the hardest working guy has a great mind for wrestling a super nice person um, uh, consider him a, a very close friend and uh, and a mentor and um, 
just uh, whatever happens with me and Jimmy or anything, I wish, I, I hope that Jimmy is, uh, you know, is, has continued success because uh, the guy could, you know, he, he does it all. Man. He could manage, he could, he could do an interview, he could produce an interview, he could produce uh, theme music, he could uh, sing, you know, keep on dancing, he, he could do it all. He's a, he's a, he's, he's a fabulous person. <laughs> and uh, you, you'll have fun interviewing him. Oh, we're looking forward to it. Uh, Dan, is there anything else? Um, not nothing that I can think of. Well, then we really appreciate this. And uh, if I could just say one last thing, which, sure. You know, uh, I, 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 you asked me to do this interview, and and I wanted to do it to help not only promote the in your face bookings, but also you know I'm gonna uh, as, as we discussed, I'm to try to hook you up with some interesting interview uh, people to interview and. Uh, what you guys do for the business is great, and give uh, give the fans a chance to see, you know, the inner, you know, what goes on in the minds of uh, David Penzer, if anybody still cares, or a Perry Saturn, or a, a Jimmy Hart, or, or, or uh, whoever uh, the, the the people that you've that you've done. Um, you know, I've tried to shoot straight and tried to just give my opinion. I just want to make it clear that all they are is my opinion. Uh, mm-hmm. I wish everybody in this business, uh, whether I agree with their style or or, or or not, or whether I personally like them, uh, their style or not. I wish them all the best in the world because the basic gist of the matter is uh, this business isn't in the greatest shape, as great shape as it's been in a long time. And um, being a diehard wrestling fan, uh, I hope to see the business rise back up and and uh, be in a lot better shape. And that includes WWE and TNA and Ring of Honor and anybody else that would come along. And um, so if I say anything negative or talk about my opinions, I don't want that to be misconstrued as uh, being negative towards anybody else because I wish the best for the business. I wish the best for the boys and uh, uh, hope the wrestling will stay strong. And uh, in your face bookings, give me a, give me a ring. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll put the link on the website if we haven't already. And, uh, Get that link back up, man. <laughs> the contact section and... The banner is in the banner rotation. You're the man. I'm about an hour ago, I think. Hey, do, do me a favor. When you interview Roddy, mention my name. Ah. In the, in the Word Association. I'm interested to see what he has to say. All right, sure. I'll tell you what he has to say. And mention it to Jimmy, too. Hell, mention it to everybody. Let's see who likes me and who hates me. Yeah, we're fighting as a default. I've been doing that with one of my other friends, too. So, uh, once again, thank you very much for your uh, time in this interview. It's actually been great. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm just, just me babbling. Uh, well, stay tuned for more from the Interactive Center.